Welcome to the third episode of the Cashflow Connections podcast. I'm very excited to get in this interview today because we're going to talk about a topic that's a little bit outside of my risk profile as an investor, but it just goes to show you there's a lot of different strategies out there. There's a lot of different ways to be successful in real estate. So the topic for today is the land entitlement process. This is the process of acquiring the rights to develop property for specific uses. So for example, if you purchase a self-storage facility and turn it into a multifamily apartment, you have to deal with the government agencies to allow for this change in how the land is entitled. It can be a very complicated, lengthy, and expensive process, but at the end of the day, it can be a very lucrative way to invest, especially in highly desirable markets. So if you're interested in this topic, I guarantee you're gonna learn something. We have a very knowledgeable guest, so let's get straight to the interview. How's it going, everyone? Thanks a lot for tuning in. Today, we have a very special guest, Chris Tortolot, who is the Vice President of Acquisitions at Latera Development. They are a privately owned real estate investment company based out of Los Angeles, California. Currently, they have about $600 million in investment value across 15 active properties. Prior to his role at Latera, Chris was a director of Prudential, where he oversaw more than 20 development deals that had a cost basis of more than $1 billion. So, Earlier in the first podcast, I mentioned we're going to have some absolute titans in the industry. Chris is certainly that. He is incredibly knowledgeable, especially when it comes to development and land entitlement, which is the topic of today's podcast. So Chris, thanks a lot for coming on the program. Tell us a little bit more about your background and and how you got started in the industry. Yeah, sure. No, thank you for the introduction and hello, everybody. Uh, So I went to school at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, where I got a degree in finance uh, and a minor in real property development. So that was a, you know, that was great to start my my undergrad at Cal Poly. Uh, right after Cal Poly, I moved up to San Francisco where I worked at Prudential Real Estate Investors. And PREI, a wholly owned subsidiary of Prudential Financial, uh, invests in the private equity capacity in real estate. So we're a limited partner uh, and we invest in spon- we invested in sponsors and developers. I started at uh, PREI as an analyst, as you mentioned, uh, where I was working on all product types, so everything from multifamily, office, retail, industrial, hotels, doing acquisitions, all kind of up and down the West Coast. Great experience. I highly recommend folks uh, spend a bit of time working kind of for an institutional company if they have the opportunity, because it's it's a great learning experience. From there, I, I became an associate uh, where I oversaw a team of analysts, and we did several large transactions, probably about a billion dollars worth, uh, recapitalized a big public data center REIT, closed a couple of large office buildings in downtown San Francisco, and did some apartment uh, acquisitions as well. And then I moved up into a role uh, where I was the director of development, and I was overseeing our apartment development on the West Coast underneath a guy named Paul Bordona, who was kind of the godfather of apartments. That was a great experience. Uh, So I was really on the capital side, the investor side at that point. And then uh, about two years ago, after I had been at Prudential for seven years, my my father, who's the president of Latera, uh, gave me the opportunity to come down here and join the business. And so I left Prudential. Uh, about two years ago, came down and joined on the developer side. And as you mentioned, we we do a lot of land entitlement work and a lot of development work. And since I've been here, we've been very, very active, and we're very active right now. We have a lot of very interesting deals under contract, uh, and I, you know, we can we can go through some of those. So it's it's been great experience. Yeah, that's awesome. In fact, prior to the recording started, you know, we we just started talking, and it sounds like you guys are just absolutely killing it. So I'm I'm very interested to hear where this conversation goes. So before we jump into the the nuts and bolts of this, let's talk about from a big picture perspective, tell us what this land entitlement process involves. This is something a lot of, especially cash flow investors aren't that familiar with. Yeah, absolutely. So it all starts with with the land acquisition, right? And, and, And what it involves is you or looking in infill, we are looking at infill sites in Los Angeles. We're not too suburban. And you look, you look within Los Angeles, there's a very limited supply uh, of land, right? You have geographic barriers with the Pacific Ocean, and as you go east, you start to get into kind of a non-urban environment. Uh, and and you, we identify sites where we think the current use is not the highest and best use. In some cases, that might be a self-storage facility. In other cases, it could just be dirt. It's unlikely you have a great location and you're just dirt, but it could be, or it could be a surface parking lot in Hollywood. 
uh, which we're doing right now an entitlement on. And you want to change that use to a different use uh, whereby you can build a project, whether it's office or a hotel or apartments, uh, and create significant value and ultimately income. And for us, it all starts with the acquisition. So we see a lot of deals uh, come across our desk. We turn over a lot of stones. Uh, but when we find a site that we really like, uh, we underwrite that site. We create a pro forma. Uh, we look at the underlying zoning. We look at the specific plan, and we all, if there is one. And we ultimately create uh, what we call a feasibility study, which essentially says this is what we think we can build. If it's an apartment project, this is how many units we can get. If it's a for-sale residential project, meaning we're going to design uh, townhomes or single-family homes, uh, we look at how many units can we fit. Uh, we put together a team of consultants, very good consultants, entitlement consultants, due diligence consultants, neighborhood outreach consultants. We put together a very good team. Uh, and then we'll meet with the city staff prior to closing to really get a sense for their level of interest in the project and to get to know them better. Uh, we'll submit our entitlement application. We'll move through the process. And ultimately, you end up meeting with planning commission and or city council, depending on the level of entitlement ask that you're asking for, and we'll get to that in a bit, uh, and hopefully you get approvals. And, and once you're approved, there's a short appeal period for the residents to come out and appeal if they object. Uh, if they don't, then you move forward, you're entitled, and you, you either sell the property uh, to a builder because you've created substantial value, or you build it yourself or ourselves. Interesting. So, yeah, there's so many different, uh, so many different aspects of this particular asset class. It's it's very unique. So, right now, where are you seeing the majority of the value add coming from in the, in the markets that you're focused on? Which, from my understanding, highly desirable, particularly Southern California markets. So, what what are you typically changing the entitlement from and to? Yeah, good question. And and the, for us, part of the value add happens when the gavel comes down on the table, and that's the gavel of the city council saying approved, and, and that is when significant value uh, is created for us. So we, we have an appetite for entitlement risk that varies depending on the jurisdiction that we are in. Uh, we have been focusing on, in the city of Los Angeles, we have been focusing on what I will call as of right, and I'll put that in quotation marks, as of right, and as of right site means that based on the existing underlying zoning and the existing general plan and the specific plan, if there is one, uh, you can build what you intend, uh, what you intend to build is allowable uh, underneath the existing zoning and specific plan. So that's an as of right development. I wouldn't say that the risk is zero if it's as of right, uh, but it's significantly less than if you're making a larger entitlement ask, such as a zone change. We do do zone changes. Uh, when we do zone changes, we're very, very careful about uh, what we're doing. Oftentimes, the underlying general plan, which is the plan created by the planning staff and approved by city council, which outlines uh, what the zoning is within a specific city for different pockets of land, oftentimes the zoning is inconsistent with the general plan because there, there will be a general plan update. Uh, it changes uh, the desired use of a specific area, but the zoning has not yet changed. And if we're changing the zoning to conform to the underlying general plan, then we feel quite a bit better uh, about that ask. If, if you're looking for a zone change and a general plan amendment, that's the most challenging, highest risk ask you can do. Uh, we've done all of those. And it really depends on the jurisdiction that you're in and kind of what you're changing a site from and what you're changing it to. Uh, a couple examples. Uh, we have a site right now. It's in Los Feliz, very, very good submarket. Uh, the underlying specific plan and zoning allows for residential. We can get 96 units, apartment rate uh, market units. So 96 units. There's an existing retail center on the site currently, about 13,000 square feet. It's about an acre. Uh, that's not the highest and best use by any means. This is a very, very good sub-market. 15,000 jobs, one or two blocks away, right adjacent to Barnsdale Art Park. Fantastic sub-market. So the highest and best use is residential. There's a huge shortage of residential housing. Homes are very, very expensive, uh, and there's no new institutional products. So we look at this site and we say, wow, this is fantastic. 
the underlying zoning allows for 96 units. There's a specific plan that the city put in place uh, that provides further uh, information on what, what the city would like to see built uh, within that specific plan. The area that we're in, it allows for residential. So we look at that site and we say, this is a covered land play. And what I mean by that is during the period in which we're processing entitlements, we're collecting income from an existing retail center. So what happens if you get botched on your entitlements, if you, if you don't get what you're asking for? Well, in this scenario, you have a retail center. So we have to go in with a purchase price uh, where we feel that if we do not get our entitlement ask approved, we're okay as a retail center. Are we going to make a lot of money in that scenario? No. But are we going to lose money? No. And that's what's important because the upside to getting your entitlements approved is very, very large in this instance. So that's what I would call an as-of-right ask. Kind of on the other end of the spectrum, we have a site in Burbank. We recently put it under an option, and, and you and I can maybe talk about that you know, at some point during this interview as well, is kind of what does that mean. But essentially, we have about two years, maybe 18 months left at this point, uh, to acquire the land. But we do have the option to purchase it. It requires a zone change to conform to the underlying general plan. It's about an eight-acre site, so it's a large site. We're currently planning 540 apartments in a 15-story, 300-room hotel. So this is going to be a very big mixed-use development wow. uh, that will connect into downtown Burbank and will really help solve uh, Burbank's housing crisis, which they do have. Uh, this is an instance where we're changing the zoning to conform to the general plan, a bigger ask uh, than an as-of-right ask. So here we're comfortable doing that uh, for a few reasons, one of them being we don't have to purchase the land uh, for either 18 months or until we get our entitlements complete. So that's a good way to mitigate your risk in a situation where you're making a more uh, challenging entitlement ask. Absolutely. That makes total sense. In fact, this how, how common do you find that structure is possible given, given the seller's uh, willingness to engage in some kind of contract like that, that really provides you with that uh, flexibility? You know, it's tough. A lot of sellers want to want to sell the land kind of on an as-is uh, basis. So it's tough, but it, it involves some negotiation. Uh, and oftentimes it involves a little bit higher of a purchase price. But it, for us, it mitigates our risk substantially. If you could buy a $50 million site today, unentitled, or pay $55 million in 18 months uh, without having to write the check until you're entitled, it's, it's worth it, in our opinion, to pay a little bit more to really shield yourself from significant risk. Because once you're entitled, maybe that $55 million site is worth $75 million. And, and typically that's how the math works. So that's, that's uh, how we structure our deals. And yeah, to your, to your question, it, it involves negotiation and oftentimes a slightly higher purchase price and, and finding sellers uh, that are open to that type of structure, which involves looking at a lot of deals. Yeah, that's that's obviously going to be one of my next questions. So being that you are the vice president of acquisitions, how are you finding these extremely motivated sellers that are sitting on highly desirable land? You know, it involves looking at a lot of deals. So I, I, I would say that we probably get five deals a day, five incoming new opportunities per day. That's That's a lot, right? That's 25 a week. Um, 100 a month, and, and we look at almost all of them. So a new deal will come in. Typically, they come in from a broker, a third-party broker. We have a very great relationship uh, base with brokers throughout Southern California, and, and that, that helps a lot. There are off-market brokers as well who are really approaching sellers or owners of sites and saying, hey, would you be interested in selling? If they say yes, then they come to us, uh, which is different than a broker who is listed buy a seller to sell it and broadcast it out to the world. So we have off-market brokers. Even our consultants, architects, um, even people at title companies send us deals. They have good access to deals because maybe the owner of a site says, hey, what could I build here? I've owned this for 30 years. My grandfather passed it down to me, but the market's hot. Um, you know, what could I do here? And they could go to an architect and say, you know, what, what do you think I could build here? Uh, and the architect will put forth the feasibility study. And then that architect oftentimes will come to Latera say, hey, I think I got something here, guys. You should meet with this seller. And so that's a very um, off-market way to, to come across opportunities. And, and we try to do that. If someone has this 
capability. They're sitting on this very desirable land. What is it? Why don't they just simply entitle the land themselves? What is it the value add that you guys are bringing to the situation? Is it the relationships with the government agencies or the relationships with the architects? What is it that they're not seeing that you're seeing? I would say it's our secret sauce, I think, in part, is our uh, ability to be successful uh, during the entitlement process. It, it's not easy. Uh, it, it does require some capital up front. So sometimes folks don't have the, the capital needed, so it requires capital. It certainly requires a very specific skill set, which we have, uh, and it requires relationships. I think relationships are a big one. We have good relationships with various folks within the city of Los Angeles and in other jurisdictions as well. And, and we are a trusted developer who people like. And, you know, one example is a lot of times we, we will come across developers who they don't even go in and meet with the city. They will send their entitlement counsel, their lawyers, and their consultants into the meetings, uh, and they will work with the city. But oftentimes they don't meet, meet the city officials. It's a lot, I think, easier for a city official to not support a project when they're just interacting with a lawyer. But when you walk in the door and you sit down and, and, and you're a nice guy and you smile and you look them in the eye and, and, and they get to know you and they realize that you're genuine and real and a good person, I think, I think that makes a big difference. So it, part of it has to do with really going in there and, and meeting um, the key players yourself, right, and being friendly and honest. And, and I think that is one of our competitive advantages as well. And then we have a very, very good team of consultants. So we have excellent consultants. We have a good neighborhood outreach consultant. We have a good political lobbyist consultant. Uh, so we have, we have great consultants as well. And then thirdly, I think it comes down to selecting uh, sites and properties where the entitlement ask is somewhat in the box. And if it's not in the box, you have to have a compelling reason uh, to process the entitlement. Maybe it's a self-storage facility in the middle of a neighborhood and the neighbors are kind of sick of looking at it, right? So if you can uh, re-entitle that to a mixed-use project or a, or a for-sale residential project, you're going to have more success uh, than going into a neighborhood and increasing density um, and adding a high-rise, for example, which would never happen. So uh, site selection is another element. Given that there's no cash flow, I know that a lot of investors, especially those listening to this podcast, cash flow focused investors, it kind of bumps the risk return uh, towards riskier given there's a potentially much larger upside, but the cash flow, the dependability that's provided there just simply isn't there because it's, it's land. So from a deal structure standpoint, how do you, what are some of the strategies you use that you implement to protect investors and what are some of the conversations you have? to kind of show them that they're well protected, even though there isn't any predictable cash flow? Right. Good question. And, and, and it's all about risk adjusted return, right? So if, if you have a very low risk deal, the return's going to be lower. And as you move up the risk spectrum, you, you must expect a higher return. So uh, part of it is, yes, land entitlement deals are more risky than a cash flowing asset, but the payout uh, in the multiple and the IRR you know, will be quite a bit higher, uh, should be quite a bit higher. And so uh, that's, that's kind of the first factor is what's the risk adjusted return. And, and we, we do shield our investors as best we can. And I think um, one of the main ways we do it is through optioning the land, as I discussed previously. So we are not actually taking down or acquiring the land prior to entitlements. We put it under a contract uh, whereby we have the option to acquire it at the end of entitlements. That said, if, if entitlements are not processed, uh, there is still a decent amount of capital that's been spent, one, on, on some sort of a deposit to have the right to option it, uh, and two, for architecture and engineering work, entitlement counsel, consultants, due diligence, legal, uh, etc. So it doesn't eliminate the risk, but it does reduce it. Uh, another way we can do that uh, reduce risk is to look at what's what's the downside scenario. So if you acquire a piece of land and you're not successful in your entitlement, what are you left with? And you want to make sure that what you're left with is something 
uh, usable, workable, and something that is worth something kind of close to what you paid for it so that you can sell it. So if you're buying a self-storage facility, you're left with self-storage. Uh, so maybe maybe your IRR is a break even. Maybe you're not going to make any money on your investment if you don't succeed, but you're protected. You have downside protection. So we look for we look for opportunities that have downside protection. Uh, another way is in some cases it's not a matter of if you will get entitlements, but really when. So if you remain focused, dedicated, uh, you will wear the other side out which is really the neighborhoods or people who object, as long as what you're asking for is reasonable. Um, so, so, so part of it is can you, can you stomach waiting? And then I think a third factor is um, if, if, if we were so unfortunate to be in a position where we had a piece of land uh, that we were entitling and the market changed and we went into a recession, uh, I think you want to have the ability to, to hold it. And so it's, if you can go to your investors and say, hey, guys, there's a systematic downturn here. Uh, the value of our land dropped 20%, but we're not just going to sell it and have folks lose money. Uh, we want to have the ability to hold it and say, hey, guys, would you rather you know, have 70% of your money back now or would you rather get a 1.5x multiple in four years? I think you will find that most people, unless they have cash flow requirements right away, would prefer to not lose money and wait it out. And so waiting out the storm. So having that ability... I think I think is important as well. And then you know the, the final component of that of that question for my answer is uh, you just got to be really smart about the deals that you do. So when you get a deal tied up, uh, it's you, you want to go and you want to meet with the city officials personally. You want to get their sense. Ask them what do you guys think about this? Uh, what would you like to see here? Would you support this project? And typically. Uh, if it's a good project and it's well designed and your entitlement ask is reasonable, they will get behind it. And so that's but but it's important to do that rather than just to assume you can kind of just get it done. So I think that's important. You got to do great due diligence. You got to have your environmental report, your soils report, your survey. Um, you got to have great due diligence. I think that makes a big difference in, in getting a good team of consultants. So we're look we're very selective about the deals we do when we do bring in investors. Um, we're, you know, we're very cognizant of uh, protecting their capital as, as best as we can. And those are some of the ways we do it. Got it. So one of the ways, obviously, you know, worst case scenario, especially if you're buying in highly desirable locations, like it sounds like you're exclusively focusing on, the waiting it out is relatively straightforward as long as you have the time to do that. And part of the problem that a lot of investors get into is they don't give themselves the time because they take out leverage that's too, too aggressive and they have principal balances coming due. So that's one of the major questions here is, do you use leverage? And if, if you do, how do you, um, how significant is that leverage? Yeah, that's a good segue, right, into, into your question for my last question. And the answer is, it's, we don't put leverage on land opportunities unless there is existing income in place. So, if we're going to go buy a piece of dirt, we, like for example, we acquired a site in Winnetka, uh, and we did we did not put any leverage on it because it was just raw land. But on our Los Feliz site that I referenced to you earlier, uh, where we have a retail center that is producing income, we will put leverage on that opportunity. And I think part of it also has to do with you know what's 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 your purchase price and how much leverage are you going to put on it. So. You, you, you want to be cognizant of that, of, you know, per, perhaps you put 30% leverage on it. Even if there isn't a loan in place, that's something that we would at least evaluate. Because if the market turns, your project or your loan will not be underwater. But to your point, if you have a large principal payment coming due, what are you going to do? Well, uh, you either have to work with the lender to extend it or bring in a new loan. There are hard, hard money lenders that will say, all right, good, we'll take out your lender and we'll go even higher in the cap stack, but our rate is 10%, right? Very expensive money. You don't want to be caught uh, in that situation. So I think you want to ask, you want to make sure that the term is uh, supports the business plan and then some. Uh, one lesson that I've you know, been taught here at Latera is, always have an extension, always. So even if you think your business plan is 18 months and your loan term is 24 months, you must always have an extension uh, because if there is a change, 
if something happens. You, you need the ability to extend for another year, and then you can kind of figure it out. You can raise a new, you can raise new capital, or you can refinance out the old capital. But got to have an extension. You don't want your business plan bumping right up against the end of your loan. Yep, that's um, very much in line with my perspective as well. And I want to ask one more question about the leverage, since it's such a critical part of this type of investment. So. In that Los Feliz deal, for example, can you give me an example uh, or an idea of how much leverage you use comparatively to the cash flow that's coming in? Yeah, sure. I mean, in that opportunity, our annual uh, net operating income is approximately $300,000, right? And so if you take your $300,000 and you divide it by 12 months, you're looking at $25,000 a month. Typically, typically a lender is going to want to have a 1.2 debt service coverage ratio. So divide by 1.2, you can support with $25,000 per month, about $20,800 in interest. What's the interest on your on a land loan? Well, sort of depends on your leverage. But let's say you can get it at 6%, which is kind of uh, middle of the road. Then you know you're 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 you can divide uh, by that amount, multiply by twelve. So you're looking at about a four point two million dollar loan uh, on, let's say, the acquisition is eleven million. You're just over forty percent. So so I think the key metric really for us is to look at the debt service debt service coverage ratio, um, which I just walked through. And then secondly, lenders will look at your loan to cost, and really they're going to just look at your purchase price. And and there are lenders that'll go up to seventy five percent. And there are lenders that want to be at 30 to 40 percent, and the pricing will be reflected. Uh, pricing meaning interest rate and origination fees will be reflected um, based upon your loan proceeds. Very cool. Yeah. So I, I appreciate you going through the breakdown there. So it's interesting that the debt coverage ratio is basically the same as typical commercial property, but you know because of the fact that the cash flow is only a small part of the deal, your overall loan to values are much more conservative. Right, because the the underlying assets not necessarily cash flowing, but they're still able to grant you that one point two percent debt coverage ratio. So, cool. I, yeah, I appreciate the breakdown there. Yeah, that's right. And what's also interesting there is your 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 loan to cost uh, could differ significantly from your loan to value uh, because maybe you're paying ten million dollars for a piece of land, but you think when you're entitled, you're going to be worth fifteen million. So if you get a $3 million loan, your loan to cost is 30%, but you think that you know, it's really closer to 20% because you feel the value of the land is, is so much higher than what you paid. But, but yeah, you're, you're, you're correct. Uh, the, the, and those loans are available. The capital markets uh, market is very strong, I think, uh, surprisingly strong for these type of bridge loans. There's a lot of bridge lenders out there right now. Okay, cool. And then are the terms typically, it sounds like it, typically takes about 24 months or so to entitle land. Are the terms, the principal due on those loans, do they align with that that estimated sale date or are those generally longer uh, balloon payments? Yeah, good question. We see deals that we think we can entitle on the shorter end of the spectrum, 12 months, on the longer end of the spectrum, 24 months. 12 to 24 is a good bracket. We want to have an additional year at the end uh, of what we think is kind of a conservative timeline for entitlements. And yes, typically these bridge loans are a term of 18 to 24 months with a one-year extension. So we want to make sure we have an extra year. But yeah, that's, that's kind of the typical term is two years plus a one-year extension. Okay, cool. I appreciate, again, I appreciate you going into the details of that. I know that that might not be the most exciting content we've ever put out, but as an investor, those are the type of things that I'm extremely interested in. So um, just to further that thought, uh, when you're looking at underwriting a deal, what are some of the major rules of thumb, things that stand out quickly uh, that you can tell if the deals are going to pencil? What do you look for with a land entitlement deal when it comes to underwriting? It sort of depends on, on what the intended use is. So let's talk about uh, an apartment deal. I, I find apartments to be very interesting, by the way. Um, I like them uh, as a product type because they're, they're always in demand. The, uh, the, the capital markets for apartments are very, very robust. And if there is a downturn, you sort of just turn down the, the rent dial a little bit and you still stay leased. Whereas with a single family home, if you don't sell it, you're holding it. 
uh, with an office building and a retail building, if you don't sign leases or tenants vacate, you could be in a very bad spot. So let's use apartment land uh, as an example. Uh, we look at a few metrics. One of them is, and this works for any product type, is what, what can the next buyer pay for your land? So if it's an apartment site, we know that they use a return uh, metric called return on cost. So a next buyer is going to want a 55 to 6% uh, untrended return on cost. And so we, we say, okay, so if they, if they need that, if they can pay $50 million for a site um, and still get their 6% untrended return on cost, what can we pay today? Well, we got to say to ourselves, we want a 1.5x multiple. And that's typical for land, um, 1.5x multiple. So you take your $50 million purchase price and you simply divide by 1.5 for you know quick math and you're like, okay, I, I, I can pay about $33 million, but then you got to back out your cost to get it entitled, right? That's, that's where you want to end up is a $33 million basis. So you back out your entitlement costs and you might find that you can pay $30 million. So, so using the next buyer's uh, return metrics allows you to kind of say, what can I sell it for? What are they going to pay? All right, you know that. Well, what kind of return do I want? Then you arrive at, really, what can you pay? So that's, that's kind of how we do it. But I think comparables are very important, too. Comps. So you'll say, yeah, I think I'm, I'm acquiring this site today. It's in Hollywood. I'm going to pay 90000 per unit, unentitled. What can I sell it for? I can tell you right now, you can sell entitled dirt in Hollywood for 150000 a unit. So that's a pretty good spread. So we look at comps, and we know these very, very well. You know, in our mind, we track them very closely. If you're looking at for sale residential land, it's not too different. A next buyer uses typically, like a public or private home builder, they'll look at their profit margin a little bit different, but they take their total revenues minus their total expenses, and they want to be kind of a 12 to 15% profit margin. So we know uh, what, what we can sell it for, and then we back out the cost uh, that it will that we'll have to pay to get it entitled, and we kind of wind up with our purchase price based on our, our desired multiple, which is usually about a 1.5x. The interesting thing about this, um, especially from my perspective, the fact that you're able to achieve those type of returns without significant leverage risk is significantly changes the risk profile of the land entitlement process. I know, for example, that there are a lot of teams out there, you probably know far more than me, that are very aggressive with their leverage. And they've found people that are willing to, to loan them money with short one to two year terms. And they're anticipating the land entitlement being done and then them selling it very quickly. And if they don't, they're going to be in a very bad position. Now, if you're able to do this strategy with zero leverage or leverage that is typical 1.2% debt coverage ratio... To me, that that tremendously changes the risk profile of the investment, especially if you're exclusively focusing in highly desirable markets. Now, I obviously <laughs> you can't the, the game is not the same if you're in Fayetteville, Arkansas, trying to entitle land because the desirability of the markets changes significantly sometimes. But in Southern California in particular, if there is a downturn, if there's a very significant downturn, those properties, that that land value is going to still be there, especially in two or three years. So if you have that type of leeway, you're going to be in a fine position. This is something that is continued from cycle to cycle to cycle, especially in these highly desirable, uh, you know, coast-facing states. Yeah, no, I I think that's very well said. I agree, and I would say that as we're out raising institutional capital for our project. Uh, it is much easier to raise money for a well loc or to sell a well located site than it is a, a suburban site. So being infill, uh, it makes a very big difference. I agree, and, and and there is some protection there. Cool. So I got to close out the. I got a couple closing questions that I want to ask you. That's that's very uh, very interesting, especially since a lot of these investors is going to be the first time they've ever heard of land entitlement. They probably got a very good sense of the type of detail that you look at. So whether it be at Prudential, whether it be at Latera, what is some of the things that you wish you had learned earlier that some of the listeners could now learn from you? Or what are some of the things you wish you had done differently? You know, I, I would say that I would be a very rich 32-year-old uh, young man 
sitting here on the phone with you all, um, if I had jumped in at the bottom of the cycle in 2009 and 2010 uh, and just bought everything I could. Now, that being said, everybody, everybody sort of thinks that way. But I think you've got to be able to take risks. Um, you've you got to have an appetite for risk. I, me leaving Prudential uh, was a somewhat risky move. I was leaving an institutional company uh, and, and moving down uh, here to work for a developer, uh, which, which really was, was sort of a, a risky move. But I'm glad that I did that. And my timing was good. It's a great company. And I think we're going to, you know, we're making a lot of money. We're killing it. And we're going to keep killing it. Um, but maybe I should have left Prudential a little bit sooner, right, when, uh, when the market was even cooler than it is now. But I'm happy with what I did. My timing, I think, was good. But really, I mean, I think, I think you've got to take risks. I know a lot of people who work for institutional companies, and they say, oh, I want to be a developer one day. I want to work for a developer. I want to be a developer. I'm like, great. Um, so when are you going to do it? Well, maybe yeah. next year. Kind of maybe next year. So I think, I think take, take risks and do them while you're younger if you can. But if you're not, that's fine too. But I think, I think you've got to be able to take risk, um, and I think it's worth it, and I think it's exciting. So um, you know, I, I'd say that, that's, that's an important takeaway here. Yeah, I agree completely. And, you know, I actually, my strategy, my investment strategy is very different on a risk adjusted basis. However, I agree completely that I wish I had focused slightly more on value add focused opportunities a little earlier in my career, uh, especially because the market was so clearly depressed. It, you know, all of us are going to say we wish we had taken more risk and more leverage uh, at this time of the cycle. But, um, the way that I was able to do it, and it sounds like the way that this has really helped Latera in particular, is by having a really solid team around you. And especially with the land entitlement, is it sounds like you just have consultants and relationships one after the other. Real estate is not a individual type of investment class. You have to be it has to be a team sport. It has to be a team sport in order for you to be successful because you necessarily have to rely on other people. This is very different from something like stocks or trading commodities, you can be a millionaire if you just sit on your computer and trade some kind of uh, index fund on a daily basis. It's not the way that it goes in real estate. You have to rely on other people that have specialized skills and you leverage those skills and their expertise to achieve your financial goals. So that's one of the reasons I like real estate because you, you're working with people that have to depend on other people, meaning they have to be nice to you and deliver on their promises. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So obviously it's just the beginning of 2017. What are you most excited for, for this year? What are you most excited for, for the future? Good question. I, I am very, very happy with, with where we're at right now at Latera development. We have probably uh, 12 active deals right now. Uh, we're batting a thousand on the entitlements, meaning uh, we've never not gotten what we've asked for, which which is key. So we have 100% success rate. Right now we have we we've grown substantially. Just to give you a sense, for some of the things we're working on right now, uh, we have a 125 million dollar uh, total capitalization project in Hollywood. We have another hundred million dollar project in Silver Lake. We have 228 apartments under construction in Orange County. Another 97 in Chula Vista, a great workforce housing submarket. Um, and we probably have 10 land deals uh, that we're at some stage of entitlement on. We actually sold about six last year. We, we put a, a very, very uh, nice site under an option agreement in Burbank, as I mentioned earlier, eight acres, 550 units almost in a 15-story hotel. So we, uh, that's what we have right now. And then additionally, we have about six projects currently under contract uh, which and they're great projects. And one of them is a nearly a 500 unit uh, value add project in Las Vegas. Um, a, a few of them are apartment development sites here in the city. The Los Feliz site I told you about. Another one in West Hollywood. Um, a couple more sites, kind of in the Silver Lake Echo Park area. Uh, so we're we're just growing at an incredible rate. I, I would say you know not you know don't want to beat our own drum uh, too much, but I do think that. 
uh, Latera is, you know, a big up-and-coming uh, firm here in Southern California, and I think we have some of the best real estate uh, of any firm in Southern California, and I know we're the most transactional uh, probably of any real estate company in Southern California. We're right up there. Um, so, so to me, that's very, very exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can continue to grow in 2017, attract and retain good talent, uh, and continue to expand the organization. So it puts us in a really, really exciting spot. Uh, it's a lot of work. You know, I'm working my butt off um, nights, weekends, kind of working all the time, but it's, 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 it's very exciting. Um, so I just can't wait to see where it goes. And I would say uh, that I think 2017 is going to be a very, very strong year for real estate, and I feel the same way about 2018. Uh, my crystal ball doesn't go much past 2018, but that being said, I think it's key to remember there's a huge housing shortage going on here in Southern California, uh, really, and in, in many other markets, not just Southern California, where there's a huge, huge demand for housing, uh, and there's just not the supply. So people talk about the next downturn. Well, you're going to have to have a major, major drop off in demand um, because the, the, the addition to supply, it's just not there. So I feel very good about the next couple of years. I'm not concerned about rising interest rates. Uh, I think they will rise, but I don't think it's going to be a huge impact to our business. It'll be a minor impact. Uh, and I'm very excited uh, to, see, to see what happens over the next couple of years. Awesome. Well, that is very exciting. I think that's a great note to end it on. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the program. And, you know, this is interesting for the listeners. This is the first part of this exciting process that is development. So hopefully we'll have you on in a couple of months to talk about the next part, which is the development, which I know that you're very knowledgeable about as well. So, Chris, thanks again. And uh, we'll talk soon. Hey, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Hunter. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor to be on your podcast. and I look forward to coming back again. For the listeners out there, if you can take one second right now, open up your iPhone, open up the podcast app and search for Cash Flow Connections. The first thing that will pop up is this podcast you're listening to right now. If you subscribe on the podcast app, the episodes will automatically get sent straight to your phone every time we put one out. That way you'll never miss an episode and you'll be able to listen to them at your convenience. Of course, you can always subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. We appreciate all of them. Thanks a lot.